our discussion will be uh, with uh, George Katsifikas, who has written uh, two books uh, on the uprisings uh, in Asia, uh, which has uh, taken place in the uh, recent uh, 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 decades. The first uh, uh, book uh, uh, was on uh, uh, South Korea, the uh, Kwanju Uprising. The uh, second book on uh, several countries, uh, such as the, uh, 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 the Philippines, uh, Burma, Tibet, China, Taiwan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Thailand, and Indonesia. Uh, prior to that, he has written on the uh, French uh, uh, uprisings in 1968 and also uh, several countries in uh, Central Europe. Uh, so, uh, uh, today we will uh, try to discuss the particularly the Asian experiences. So, the first question, George, I would uh, like to put to you is see now uh, this much of uh, you know, work has been done on these very important uprisings in Asia. But very little is talked about, about this. The uh, Arab Spring, everybody is uh, almost become a household word all over the world. But these uprisings have not become part of the global conversation. What do you think is the reason? Well, I'm, certainly there's several reasons uh, for the really lack of information about Asia. I think, first of all, there's no oil in Asia. And oil, of course, is what makes headlines, it makes economies run. And yet, one could say that it, growth in the world economy has occurred in Asia. And one would uh, expect the social movements here to be covered. Yet, uh, investors are not so interested in hearing about social movements and uprisings. They prefer to hear about stability. But I think uh, there's a couple of other reasons. One is the repression of information, particularly in South Korea, where there was a military dictatorship that tried to cover up its massacre of hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people in Gwangju in 1980. But the other, and I think this really goes to the heart of the matter, is a Eurocentric bias uh, in history and the understanding of history. The Kwangju uprising of 1980 was a 20th century Paris Commune. It went beyond the Paris Commune in terms of the self-organization of the people, their armed capacity, uh, and in many other respects, it's direct democracy. And yet very few people today, particularly Europeans and Americans, could say one intelligent sentence about the Kwangju uprising. Uh, yet they could speak for hours about the Paris Commune of the 19th century. Why is that? Well, again, we could look at the reasons, but I think one of the key reasons is a Eurocentric bias to history. So, if I don't know anything about uh, Paris Commune, I'm a, I'll be treated as an ignorant person. If I don't know anything or if I don't talk anything about the Kwanju uprising, which you say is even more significant than the Paris Commune, that doesn't matter. It seems doesn't matter. It is not a challenge to the extent to which a person is aware of the uh, the history. That's right. Similarly, we all know the Arab Spring, and the Arab Spring really has uh, occurred in a dozen or more countries within a very compressed period of time, a few years. But I'm talking about an Asian wave of democratization and uprisings, where in six years from 1986 to 1992, in nine places, eight dictatorships were overthrown. And yet even in the region itself, these movements, these uprisings, these successful stories are hardly known. Uh, in the aftermath of the Kwangju uprising, the rumblings of democratic movements in Asia were very profound. And very quickly, uh, after uh, a certain period of time had passed when the Kwangju uprising became known. South Korea was moving toward democratization, as was the Philippines. In 1986 in the Philippines, a popular movement overthrew the Marcos dictatorship. In 1987 in South Korea, 19 days of illegal demonstrations involving hundreds of thousands of people, with Kwangju centrally in their minds. 
overthrew the military dictatorship, compelled direct presidential elections. In 1988 in Burma, Ne Win, who had been in power for decades, was compelled to resign. And within a month, his successor was also compelled to resign before a new military uh, government massacred thousands of people and seized power ruthlessly. In 1989 in Tibet and later in China, there were tremendous movements for democracy. In 1990 in Taiwan, Bangladesh, and Nepal, there were successful movements for democratization in all three places as was in Thailand in 1992. So as I say, in this six-year period, we see remarkable uprisings occurring. And there's not, we can't look at this from objective factors to find the underlying reason. Really, the reason was there is a momentum that gathers and that produces these mass protests that continue to feed upon each other, as we see happening, for instance, later with the Arab Spring, the Occupy movement, the Greek uprising, the Spanish indignatus. So uh, we see it today in Brazil. We see it today with protests spreading all over the world uh, in various moments. So this phenomenon yeah. is extremely important to try to understand. Yeah, see, now when people uh, speak about the uh, democracy and rule of law in Asia, it's very bleak and there's no hope and all this. But all these uprisings that you are talking about were basically uprisings for democracy. There was mass demand as supported by, uh, uh, in uh, se several instances, even by armed forces, like in Philippines, demand for uh, greater democracy. So what we see here, by way of saying a very pessimistic approach to democracy in Asia, is certain kind of ignorance that, in fact, these struggles, which uh, had a momentous uh, impact in their society, is continuous. There are contradictions, there are various problems, but democracy is not a hopeless affair in, uh, uh, in uh, Asia. Yes, well, I think you're right. It's, there's a, an element of ignorance here, but I would call it studious ignorance because it seems to me Asia is so important to the major corporations and banks of the world. As I've said in the last 30 years, much of the world's economic growth has occurred here. That there, and not only that, but in the latter part of the 20th century, United States wars killed between 5 and 10 million Asians in Korea and Vietnam. These were horrendous wars. And I'm, I'm leaving out, for instance, the CIA instigated massacre in Indonesia of communists in 1965. I'm leaving out many other things we could talk about here. But if we just look at Vietnam and Korea and the U.S. wars there, they required the dehumanization of Asians. The you know, U.S. soldiers routinely called uh, Vietnamese and Koreans gooks. And there were massacres. My Lai is the most famous in uh, Vietnam, 1968. No gun re in Korea, 1950. So it's a studious. Asians don't care about democracy. Asians don't value human life. These are things that are taught, inculcated into the Western civilization, if we can call it that, and with disastrous results. Yeah, but uh, uh, as you mentioned uh, uh, at the very beginning, uh, uh, so uh, in the academic world itself, mm. in the places where theories are made, uh, there is, uh, it appears, uh, uh, a very serious problem uh, in terms of uh, Eurocentrism. Uh, we are talking about uh, about 600 years uh, of history. But today, in terms of the rise of China and rise of India, mm. uh, uh, for the first time, uh, everybody is waking up to the fact that the world is larger than Europe. And uh, here, these are events which have happened here. So the, the very theoretical foundations of, the, uh, of political science, uh, social sciences, are what is really, uh, uh, you know, at stake. So that is why your work is very important. So perhaps you could go back into a little more details about, uh, say, let's say, beginning with the Kwanju uprising, into more details 
or why you say that it is even more important than the uh, Paris Commune? I'd first like to go back to this question of academic Eurocentrism because it's extremely important as an, and it ties to the Kwangju uprising. American scholars of Korea, including very progressive American scholars, have maintained that civil society did not exist in Korea until after democratization. They have an idea, a notion, an understanding of civil society as having been produced in Europe out of the Middle Ages with urbanization and so on, that it's the, that Eurocentric model is how civil society must be produced with certain kinds of the individual, with certain kinds of political formations. And yet we see in Asia, particularly in Korea in my understanding, extraordinarily rich forms of civil society that have never been uprooted by the penetration of capitalism and Western expansionism into the region. And these are sources of, of nourishment and growth for the uprisings that I talk about here. So, so actually what we are talking about are not just 600 years of history, but about sometimes 3,000 or even 5,000 years of history. Now, if you go back into, for example, India, you find the most dynamic moments of, you know, uh, uh, like uh, a period of Ahsoka. Exactly. Where an uh, emperor says the war is wrong. I have been involved in war. I'm wrong. And he goes to make reforms, uh, where to make reparation. Uh, he ensures that education for everybody. He, he makes, uh, you know, announcements everywhere in the stone, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the you pillars, know, uh, pillars, yeah, pillars, the pillars, monuments, Asokan yeah. pillars, which are, uh, and saying that everybody should be educated. This is how to keep sanitation. So, in other words, the idea of the people, you mm -hmm. know, that the people are, yeah. are important. So, that people's matter, which is at the heart of what we talk about democracy. So, uh, so uh, all this, uh, I think uh, your study could bring back uh, uh, this uh, larger perspective into these studies. Yes, well, in, when we look at ancient history and we see a, a person like Ashoka, who had an extraordinary influence, uh, we see history from the top down. And what I've tried to do in these uh, volumes is really look at history from the bottom up. So the history of Korea to me is not about the history of Sigmund Rhee and Douglas MacArthur and Kim Il-sung. It's the story of the millions of Koreans and what their aspirations are, what they want. And we see in times of uprisings people risk their lives for what they really want and what they really need. So when we look at these uprisings from the grassroots we really can see the these concrete historical meaning of freedom to millions of people who are willing, in fact, to die for it when they go into the streets. Yeah. So for, say, the people of Kwanju, yes. when the military uh, took over, the, they risked, uh, 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 you know, their lives. I think about 700,000 people of Kwanju at the time. Correct. All together uh, in uh, resisting uh, the military. They, the military was so vicious because Kwangju was the single place in all of South Korea that continued to demand democracy after the Chundu Hwan coup d'etat in December 1979. By the spring of 1980, Chundu Hwan warned Koreans he would use the army if they did not stop protesting. Only in Kwangju did people continue to protest. He sent in elite paratroopers off of the front lines with North Korea with U.S. permission, and they attacked the people of Kwangju as though they were enemies. Using bayonets and specially designed clubs, they broke bones and killed people. Even taxi drivers who stopped to pick up the wounded and take them to hospital were themselves killed by the military. The police chief of Kwangju refused to order his men to take part in the carnage. He was taken away and tortured. General Chung Ung, the commander of the local uh, military, refused to order his men to open fire. Paratroopers landed behind his command post, took him away. So the police and many uh, civil servants 
joined with the people in opposing the army. But there were more than 20,000 paratroopers and army soldiers in Gwangju. And at one point, it appeared the army might, in fact, win, as they normally do when they go into an area with guns. And they were using machine guns, flamethrowers, all kinds of weapons against people. But what happened was so remarkable in Gwangju because without any previous organization, people themselves defeated the military. At that critical moment, when it appeared the military was going to win, suddenly a dozen or so big buses and a hundred taxis had formed themselves into a column, and they were joined by over a hundred thousand uh, people, citizens, who marched toward the military lines. And in a couple of very heavy nights of fighting, the military were compelled to withdraw. So at one point, there is a standoff on the one side, there is this large military, uh, all with the modern weapons and everything, is there. On the other side are 700,000 uh, people. And they face to face, they are just there. And the, the people, you know, uh, uh, keep on resisting for several days. How many days? Well, from May 18th until May 21st, the fighting went on unabated. There were... There was a point, like you say, where the military was exhausted, people were exhausted, and so the night of May 20th, there was a, some, let's say, uh, gathering on both sides. And on May 21st, in front of the provincial capital, more than 100,000 people gathered, and the military was lined up. The military at that point, even though people were not fighting with them, opened fire when the, at a prearranged signal. Within hours, people had armed themselves to the teeth and a, taken weapons from the military, mounted machine guns on high buildings, and compelled the military to withdraw. During the time of liberated Kwangju, that is from May 21st in the evening until May 27th, when the military came in with many tanks, helicopters, and retook, bloodily retook the city, liberated Kwangju governed itself through direct democracy without anyone saying come to the square in front of uh, or I should say circle in front of the province hall hundreds of thousands of people gathered every day and spontaneously assembled themselves into discussions deliberations that were democratic that had many differences to be sure some people said what are we doing this is crazy we should surrender the weapons we've seized other people said, what we're doing is defending ourselves. We were being killed. So we can't surrender until the military, one, apologizes, two, restores to the victims and all of us the honor of, of being honorable citizens, not being criminals, three, makes reparations for the damages they've done, and four, arrests the men at the top who are responsible for the carnage. And this is what people in general agreed on in these rallies, these mass democratic meetings. So at one point someone said, well, we're debating this, but they're holding hundreds of our people on the outskirts of town and they're torturing many. Why don't we send some weapons to the military and get some of our people back? And everybody said, that's a great idea. Let's try that. They did it. Within a few hours, dozens of people were returned and came to the rally amidst cheers, uh, as were secret military agents infiltrated at that time as well. Uh, but nonetheless, the people of Kwangju, through direct democracy, governed themselves. Now, the Paris Commune, by contrast, had started with a drum roll of the pre-existing National Guard of Paris, who refused to allow the Prussians, victorious in a war with France, to take over the city. So it was pre-existing military units that led the uprising. They did have elections for representatives, and after the elections, uh, Paris was governed by the Central Committee of the National Guard, by the newly elected representatives, and by neighborhood committees. But these were not, let's say, mass democratic gatherings where citizens deliberated and discussed themselves their representatives deliberated and discussed. So the Kwangju uprising was about direct democracy, the kind of democracy we talk about from ancient Greece, where citizens gathered and talked. Yeah. When the military was to enter, 
then we also see uh, uh, enormously heroic, uh, uh, really a legendary uh, 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 moment where the uh, people who were, uh, you know, guarding the, uh, the place, they gather and they discuss, what are we going to do? We can surrender. Then we are demoralizing mm. the rest of uh, 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 Korea. Or we face uh, uh, them, we will be killed. So we will not live for more than one day uh, after this. What is our choice? And then these people choose to face the military and knowing the consequences. And they, they, and they are very idealistically, you know, they, they are uh, giving them, you know, very dynamic living message for the people to say your democracy is more important than our lives. Our freedom is more important. We will no longer live as slaves is what they were saying. And they realized if they gave up, it meant that everything had been in vain, that there was no real resistance, that the core of the resistance melted away. They didn't expect tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of citizens to sacrifice their lives. In fact, they asked the young people, many high school students who had guns, who had picked up guns and were fighting in the struggle, to go home so that they could continue the struggle if all of them who were going to make that last stand were killed. And they, they were very conscious of the fact that they might die. In fact, many did die. If they didn't die, they were arrested, they were brutalized, many of them were tortured, and yet for 17 years they continued their struggle right from that moment on. In fact, we should say hundreds of thousands of people in Kwangju had been willing to die in order to fight for freedom. They saw themselves being attacked and they rose up with bare hands against flamethrowers and machine guns, later picking up the gun. And even when they were imprisoned, they threw their chairs at the judges in the trials. They, family members who had the bodies of their loved ones dumped by garbage trucks on the outskirts of the city, created a shrine, a Mangwoldong Cemetery. And when that became proof that the military had massacred people and people started coming from all over Korea to see it, the military tried to move the bodies. The family members sat in to save the cemetery. When the military tried to deny that they had been involved, Kwangju citizens began secretly to write a book. And in 1985, the first book was published. The military confiscated tens of thousands of copies. Hundreds of thousands more were printed. So by 1987, uh, the movement that had taken over the U.S. Information Center, for instance, to demand the truth about Kwangju, because the United States had in fact uh, encouraged and abetted the military dictatorship to massacre the people in Kwangju and end the uprising. So uprising has this, uh, 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 long uh, been defended by the people, finally has its own fruit. 1997, the Chen Duhuan, Rotewu go to prison. And a militarism became a thing of the past uh, in this country, which uh, militarism was, in, was so entrenched. Hopefully, but yet with the division of Korea and the continuing Cold War in Korea, the national security law still exists. Uh, it's a, a very, uh, it's a tenuous situation in some regards, but I think internally, domestically, inside South Korea, you're right. Militarism has been defeated and dismantled to some extent. And with all other limitations, South Korea still is now the most vibrant democracy in, in, in Asia. One could say that, I think. There's so so the, uh, the uprising uh, is not just uh, 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 for a few days. It's a, it's a process of democracy. Exactly. So in other words, what we are talking is a dynamic con uh, uh, con continent which is, you know, produce all this and is continued. So the, the, any idea that democracy has no hope in uh, uh, Asia mm -hmm. is, is the illusion. Exactly. The, and these uprisings, in almost every case, these uprisings stimulate the growth of autonomous media. Uh, whether or not it's a free press or an underground press, people are more concerned with politics. Subaltern groups, minorities, women, labor, win greater rights. 
Uh, even in N Nepal, for instance, child laborers marched on the capital to demand an end to uh, what we would call indentured slavery. Uh, and they've been able to win the right to education. Uh, so all kinds of reforms are made in the aftermath of these uprisings. Many theorists, academics, try to say, well, there's long-term organizing over here and uprisings over here, and somehow oppose them to each other. But yet, in, in my understanding, the two really complement each other. That long-term organizing helps lead into these uprisings, and uprisings help create many new friendships, change people's lives overnight. These become some of the most important moments in people's lives, and they live the rest of their lives in the, uh, let's say, the exhilaration and the energy of the freedom that they felt in these moments of uprising. Yeah. Now, if you go from uh, uh, Kwanju uh, to Philippines, mm. now the People's Power Movement overthrowing one of the worst dictators in Asia, the, the uprising uh, ends the uh, uh, another, you know, uh, 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 very uh, uh, period of complete suppression under the martial law. Could you? Yes, that's right. And so the Philippines is well remembered today for people power. And it is, uh, you know, a slogan that comes out of the movements of 1968. Uh, the Black Panther Party talked about all power to the people. Uh, even the Venezuelan police under Chavez, uh, the sides of their cars said all power to the people. So this notion that the people should be sovereign, not governments, not corporations, not the wealthy, but that people should be sovereign is very important. And in fact, the decisive factor in the Philippines were more than a million people who went into the streets and blocked Marcos from using his military. But Marcos, we should remember, tried to use his military to attack the rebel armed forces movement which had taken over key military bases in Manila to begin the uprising. And that movement was inspired by the movements of 1968 and had been meeting secretly, believe it or not, in the police, uh, central police station of Manila for years to organize themselves. When they took over these two key bases on the uh, main avenue in Manila, EDSA, uh, they made three phone calls right away. There, a few hundred armed rebels took over these bases. They called the American ambassador, the Japanese ambassador, and the cardinal sin of the capital of the Catholic, Catholic Church. The American ambassador helped to facilitate a direct communication line between the rebel military and the CIA through which they were provided with real-time information on Marcos's troops, aircraft, and naval uh, forces, so that the rebels actually had superior intelligence. Secondly, the rebels had the support of the people, as we've said. So when Marcos, however, tried to go on television to rally his people against the uprising, the rebel commanders quickly dispatched armed units to take over these television stations. And in gun battles with Marcos's troops, twice, killing about a dozen people, they were able to keep control of the media. When Marcos ordered his air force to move into action against the rebels, uh, the commanders of the uh, planes specifically were already won over to the rebel armed forces movement and they landed at rebel bases. In one, cases, in one case, they strafed the presidential palace, wounding some of the presidential bodyguards. So we see a combination of an armed struggle from the military, as well as this popular movement of a million Filipinos who blocked Marcos's tanks on the ground. And this popular movement was led by the Catholic Church, which was very well organized, had tens of thousands of nuns organized into what they called their uh, elite troops. And they, the nuns were able to really sit in front of the tanks and rally the population against Marcos. So this combination is very interesting. The other thing that I see about the Philippines that one should really take into account 
is that even though there were pre-existing left organizations, even armed left organizations, they were too preoccupied with, the, with their own problems and with their own, let's say, very rigid analysis to take part in this movement, which was the greatest movement in the Philippines, certainly in the 20th century, because it involved more than a million people. So uh, what's very interesting about the Philippines as well is that the pre-existing left organizations, even armed New People's Army, were too preoccupied with their own problems and with their own rigid analysis to take part in what was arguably the greatest movement in the Philippines of the 20th century. Uh, this rigidity of the left we saw in France in May 1968 when the Communist Party uh, really was unable to understand the breadth and depth of the movement, the workers' aspirations for freedom, uh, the Communist Party interpreted it as aspirations for higher pay, uh, in Italy in 1977, when the Italian Communist Party similarly failed to understand the movement, the, a broad popular movement, uh, the Philippines in 1986. So in each decade, in major movements, the rigid organizations of the left fail to be at the front of the organizations, in fact, oppose these uprisings in many cases. Yeah. See, uh, uh now, the Philippines uh, uh, people's uh, power brought about uh, one of the best constitutions uh, that has been produced, uh, you know, uh, giving uh, uh, extraordinary formulation of the uh, rights of people together with many forms of uh, uh, protection, not only a declaration of rights, but also how, how to implement rights and a, a, a constitution that is uh, has stood the test of, despite of many other, we could uh, later talk, there are, we are not talking that, uh, you know, heaven, uh, you know, descended to the earth uh, out of these uprisings. There are lots of uh, problems remaining, but major victories were won by the people. Today they have a constitution that uh, uh, after a martial law, period mm. of martial law, mm. People have a very uh, 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 constitution and uh, also they have the confidence about uh, their own uh, uh, power. And uh, uh, so again, we find a democracy uh, 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 live and, and uh, kicking, uh, uh, coming into, uh, uh, you know, uh, operate and uh, that with all difficulties uh, continues. Now, uh, suppose we uh, go to Nepal. Now again, another uh, you know wonderful uh, history being emerging. Uh, 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 today's uh, uh, Nepal is something completely different uh, to what it was. There are many problems to be resolved, but still, it is again a, a place where people are playing an enormously important role, and the the monarchy has come to an end. Perhaps we could go a little bit into Nepal. Uh, uprisings are, are terrible events in that people's lives can be destroyed. People are killed, wounded, uh, suffer disorders for years afterwards, and yet they do produce w progress in the political and social and economic lives of millions of people. In Nepal's case, the people have been called upon twice in a short period of time to have uprisings against a very corrupt and brutal monarchy. Uh, in 1990, the People's Uprising was able to abolish the absolute monarchy, and they very nicely established a constitutional monarchy. The king had been a great friend to many of the leaders of the Congress Party, and uh, it was thought that in fact, a constitutional monarchy could satisfy everyone and unify a country that has very different uh, geographic, caste, religious, ethnic, linguistic areas to it. Uh, and yet, that uh, monarchy itself contained elements that apparently assassinated some of the more progressive members of the royal family, seized power, and then seized absolute power through martial law declaration. So a second uprising in 2006 was organized, again involving sacrifices and tremendous popular support 
uh, against the government. This time, however, people insisted upon the abolition of the monarchy as a precondition to return home and not continue to stay in the streets. And on May 18, 2006, uh, the interim government abolished the monarchy of Nepal. Now, in the intervening seven years, there has yet to be agreement on a constitution. But what's important here is that there is agreement that the process should be inclusive, that no one should be left out of this process. And with Nepal's tremendous diversity, that is a real challenge. And yet, the process of governing through inclusion is really, has been enacted in the attempt to come up with this constitution. All parties, it seems, have been willing to compromise and to work with each other. Yeah. From the Maoist armed struggle all the way through the Congress party, there has been great cooperation, and I'm yeah. very hopeful uh, for the future of Nepal. Yeah. As uh, you know, uh, uh, incorporated some very radical elements in terms of that country. Mm. The uh, caste, you know, the low caste, uh, significantly being uh, represented uh, in the uh, uh, the uh, you know the the proposed parliament. So uh, and women to be significantly uh, represented. Both, you know, uh, still India has to achieve, despite of the fact that That's India right. is one of the you know the perhaps the best functioning democracy in. Uh, uh, Asia, uh, the uh, largest democracy at least, uh, yet uh, this uh, uh, caste issue, even with a great leader like uh, Ambekka, wa mm. was, uh, was unable to achieve, uh, Nepal, you know, has incorporated this. Also the women's issue. So again, what we see, of course, you know, Nepal has its own uh, problems which, you know, no uprising can erase the problems of the fact that technologically it's an extraordinarily backward country. Uh, electricity is, a, you know, large uh, part of the country does not have electricity. So there are problems, you know, uh, but the fact is that uh, in the time to come, without participation of the people, nothing will happen in that country. And the palace is a museum. That's right. So the, there have been great strides made in Nepal, but as you say, tremendous problems exist. And the, the struggle to find freedom is a continuing one, constant one. Like, I think of all the constitutions written in the aftermath of uprisings, the 1992 constitution in Thailand was probably the most advanced in incorporating elements of popular participation into representative democracy. And yet, that constitution was thrown out the window in a widely applauded, at least in the West, military coup d'etat when Thaksin was ousted in Thailand. So we see this continual tug of war. In Nepal, great progress has been made. Poverty remains a major problem. In the Philippines, we have more democratic rights. There remains perhaps even more stunted growth among children in the Philippines due to lack of nourishment. In so many countries, we see, on the one hand, great changes, on the other hand, continuing problems. Even so wonderful a human being and visionary leader as Nelson Mandela's coming to power in South Africa has the result today, one of the results, that black South Africans are even worse off economically than they were under apartheid. This speaks to the fact that uprisings go in incremental steps. We can even say, for instance, if, for instance, if the Eurocentric historians argue, well, you see, Europeans know how to make revolutions, and the Asians can't complete them, or something to that effect. Well, let's look at the French Revolution. The French Revolution resulted in some greater freedoms. It also resulted in intensified French imperialism in Asia and Africa. The American Revolution won independence for the, the colonies and greater freedoms through the Bill of Rights. It also meant intensified genocide against Native Americans in the North American continent, the massive destruction of the buffalo, and the launching of an American imperialism that 
first sought control of Latin America, then of much of Asia. So this is a, a major problem. The Russian Revolution itself led to the gulags. Every revolution, every uprising has very positive results on one level and negative. It's the balance that we can argue about, but we cannot, I think, fail to see that these social movements in themselves are the driving force of progress in the world. See, these 10 uprisings in uh, the Asia, in a context where there is almost a global consensus that coming 30 years, will change the economic and political landscape in the world with the uh, uh, rise of China, uh, the rise of uh, the uh, India and from other conditions, uh, 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 other countries, uh, the, there are the, the, the normal expectation, the, the general expectation is that there is going to be uh, much change. In other words, whether uh, anyone wants it or not, Eurocentric worldview is today is acknowledged to be in crisis. Mm. So uh, in, in a such situation, uh, in trying to understand what is to come, it is not only the economic factor of uh, places like uh, uh, China that need to be discussed, but the fact of this fact that the people themselves have made enormous progress mm -hmm. and the people aspiration is for democracy. So, uh, 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 this should be looked more positively uh, uh, into the, uh, 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 the, this aspect. So, the, the both on a theoretical uh, uh, levels in the academic world and is, is just pure realism to incorporate these studies into uh, uh, the uh, university syllabus. Young people should, you know, be able to be discussing the, this material. Uh, you have made a, con a great contribution by being, you know, m making this available. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure this will uh, uh, help other intellectuals to look and develop th this, uh, uh, these uh, uh, things. But for a short moment, if we look into also uh, what need, what were the aspects perhaps that uh, these uh, the leaders or the inspirers of this movement should look into the, the future. And then there are the, we, we, we find that there were certain limitations in the in the perspectives uh, 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 these uprisings as well as earlier ones. The Asia has seen constant the, against the uh, uh, you know the uh, British uh, imperialism. There was a whole of India rose, and mm -hmm. and uh, and they got uh, in, uh, and that's an enormous uh, you know uh, political uh, movement. Now. Uh, despite of all these achievements, the future, when we look into the future, there are certain problems people should look into. The, the, the whole issue of equality, in terms of equality for the women. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one of, one of the most fundamental issues that, that uh, need to be uh, taught. If Philippines achieve so much, but on the other hand, if the larger number of, you know, the large number of women have to be domestic helpers elsewhere, then there is an enormous contradiction uh, 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 yeah. at that point. If, uh, you know, uh, uh, other countries, the, the, uh, like uh, Thailand, which certainly achieved uh, a lot and also is continuous, you know, e even to, uh, at the moment, you see the, 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 the kind of a uh, one-party dominant uh, country is gone. It's, it's a bi-party, uh, bi the that has come to uh, uh, stay in the, the country. But there are so much of uh, to be resolved in terms of equality and also in terms of the participation of the people. The old traditions still uh, 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 survives. So uh, 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 in terms of future, what, what are some, uh, uh, some of your conclusions? Well, as you say, the people have changed, and these uprisings reveal in very specific ways how people are much more capable of self-government than we give them credit for. Uh, the Paris Commune began with a pre-organized military force. The Kwangju citizens organized themselves and drove out the military. The Paris Commune had representative democracy. The Kwangju people had direct democracy. It seems to me representative democracy is not enough. And yet, these uprisings are very often channeled 
solely into that direction by the leaders of the movement. So representative democracy, so often in the world today, including especially perhaps in the United States, fails to take into account the aspirations of people for peace, for justice, uh, from the grassroots. Uh, we, we can see this failure in governments today in Brazil. People watched as, and pe we know Brazilians love soccer, and yet they're very disillusioned with billions being spent on soccer stadiums while the schools, the healthcare system, the streets fall, are falling apart. And so Brazilians had no choice but to go into the streets uh, to make their aspirations for more equality known. So these protests then are a supplement at this point to representative democracy. But really I think what we need to institute are direct democratic forms of decision making, whether they're through public assemblies and gatherings that continue. And we've seen this in Tahrir Square, we see it in Turkey in Taksim Square where people intuitively know they need public space to make their aspirations real. Uh, but we should in fact preserve such spaces and expand them. There is also cyberspace that would permit much greater input into representative de democratic types of decisions. So people could vote up or down in referenda on very significant issues. I think what's most important though is that in the years since these Asian uprisings that I'm talking about, from the grassroots, millions of people, tens of millions of people around the world have said that the global capitalist economic system is the primary problem facing humanity. We saw these protests building in the 1970s in Africa with protests against the IMF austerity programs. In the 1980s in Latin America, protests against US imperialism. In the 1980s in Asia, protests against dictatorship. But today, uh, increasingly, in the period after Seattle in 1999, it's the global economic system that is everyone's major problem and that all these movements are now talking about the need to change. The, uh, the economic system is in serious crisis. Mm. And today there is a global crisis of, uh, uh, you know, the financial systems and all that. So there is a, a discussion in, uh, in the Europe itself, uh, in the United States and all uh, people of these countries, as well as intellectuals and theories, that the kind of democracy that was produced in the West is not enough. Mm. The kind of social contract that was developed is not enough. There has to be expansion of the, the, the social contract in order to ensure that the least advantaged people are looked after and that the, uh, the problems of uh, uh, health, the problems of education, the, the problems of uh, basic uh, necessities are the rights of everybody. I so, couldn't agree with you more, Basil. So yeah. this, this uh, 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 discourse, uh, in other words, although we are seeing, we are discussing uh, 10 Asian uprisings, we are discussing a global discourse. Exactly. And in the time you and I have been talking, hundreds, perhaps a thousand children under the age of five have died of what are really unnecessary causes due to the world gazing in the opposite direction. Now, we all know that uh, there is this major problem in the world, and we also know that it's a problem that is systematic, that is not simply anecdotal. And yet, when we look for solutions to this problem, we look the other way. Now, I think if we can look at the long historical view, European domination of the world began after the Renaissance, the European Renaissance. When, and we can see in the European art form, the idea of scientific perspective and realism, light and shadow being created from the point of view of the solitary, single individual, that these values then became incorporated in the Enlightenment with scientific reason supplanting religious faith, in the Reformation with the individual being able to worship God in any way he or she chose, not just as the Pope or the Church said, 
in the American and the French revolutions, in the industrial revolutions, all of this goes back to that single point of view of the individual, realism, solitary. In the world of art today, we see so many different kinds of art. We saw the Cubists, the Surrealists, the Dadaists break that 500 years of rigid thinking of the West. And we see today in the 21st century so many artists approaching the world from so many different points of view. This is precisely the kind of system we need today. A multi-centered, polycentric, diverse unity of all these various perspectives on the world in which people themselves express their aspirations. Yeah. And that 9-11 has, uh, uh, has created a kind of a psy psychology mm and uh, 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 security mentality in the world democracies themselves, which is really going into the heart of challenging the Renaissance ideal of the individual. Today, limitations are brought about on the, uh, the right of people for uh, not to be arrested without a reasonable uh, suspicion of a, 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 a crime. All kind of flim flimsy reasons are used for make to make uh, arrest easier. There is, uh, uh, you know, the whole the issue regarding torture. The entire uh, uh, the positions that was well established are being challenged, even by the Supreme Court of United States. Right. With the people thought, uh, you know, the the places where the democracy will be most defended. The, then we have, uh, you know, the uh, uh, detention of people uh, for breaking all the rules. The uh, habeas corpus, which was one, one time the, the greatest protection of the individual guarantee, is being challenged. In other words, uh, the, the, there is a, an attempt to challenge the very foundation of the Western society in the West itself. And this seeps into the outside, uh, outside world. And, you know, we, in the United States, the discourse about our, let's say, daily lives talks about, isn't it terrible that in Chicago so many people are being murdered in the streets? Young girls are shot for no apparent reason, even sometimes, uh, you know, while they're playing in a playground. And yet, it's President Barack Obama who is c continually and consciously murdering people through the drone program. He and the drone program have gone after the relatives, the teenage relatives of suspected terrorists that they killed because they don't want in the future these young people to try to take revenge. This is a, an out and out case of criminal activity by the President of the United States that only encourages murder in the inner cities in the United States. Yet when people say, how do we solve this problem, they blame the young kids who are doing these shootings, not the president for setting an example to them. So the system itself has turned on the individual, as you say. You, even American citizens, Obama smilingly says, can be targeted by the drone program. So yeah. So uh, uh, I think to bring this into a conclusion, uh, perhaps I could sum up some uh, uh, basic themes. These uh, 10 uprisings are uprisings demanding democracy and pa with participations of largest numbers of people. And this have a message to the world. The message which is also coming from the people uh, from, from the West that the issue of democracy should be become the, the major concern and not the issue of security. Security should be within a framework of uh, 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 democracy. Of liberty. Of liberty. Yes. The heart of the, the, the issue is about liberty. Secondly, that the, the academic community and the thinking community of the world owed to the world a larger vision of the world than a Eurocentric world yes. which belonged to a past history of 600 years. So if you are to be prepared for what they say are the big changes that are coming in the world for coming uh, 30 years. And if the world is to be safe under those circumstances, then the issue of democracy and the dialogue on democracy should be the, you know, uh, 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 more uh, uh, central place should be occupied both 
in, in the, on the views of the political leaders, in the civil society uh, organizations, and the academic community. And that the, uh, uh, these lessons which come from all histories, Western history as much as it is discussed in Asia, mm. Asian history must be discussed in, uh, uh, in Europe. So thank you very much for you know, stimulating this uh, discussion. We hope that these books uh, will be uh, uh, you know, uh, better known and uh, better read and better discussed both in Asia and outside. Thank, thank you. you.